Hello. <laughs> Hello. It's nice to meet you. I'm Anna. Hi. Hi. Your name is Maya? Yes. Oh. My uh, best friend's name is Maya too. <laughs> are, you, uh, are you from London? Uh, yes. To give you a little bit of context, I was right now in London visiting different chess clubs. And on this particular day, I was visiting a club that was hosting a chess tournament. Now, this was a really big chess tournament. There were a lot of people that were there and I wanted to try out my luck. The games were rapid, which meant that there was a little bit more of time to think. And the winner would be getting a bottle of wine or a bottle of champagne. I can't remember. Anyways, the best part about this was the fact that there were so many people and everybody was super friendly and everybody was just there having a good time. So if you're in London, I definitely recommend you to check out the different chess clubs that they have because this one was amazing. I'll put the name in the description box. We waited a little bit before the game started as everyone had to start at the same time. And then we shook hands. The game was starting. She played e4, and I replied with the only opening I know against e4, which is the Sicilian c5. She went knight f3, and I decided to push my e pawn one step. Now she played knight c3, so she didn't play the open Sicilian, which is what most people play. Instead, she kind of waited with that, so I developed my knight, and she played bishop c4. The idea of this is to kind of prevent me from playing d5. And if I play knight f6, well then she can push up her e pawn one step and really annoy my knight. I decided to play a6 because I wanted to threaten b5. And then maybe if she didn't play d3, be able to play c4. However, she stopped my plan. So I attacked her bishop and now she only had one move. She had to go bishop b3. I went bishop b7 to develop my bishop and she played a3 because she was scared of her bishop getting trapped and also maybe a little bit worried that I would play b4 later on. I was still trying to figure out how to get out the pieces on the king's side so that I could castle. So I played knight d4, active. I wanted to centralize my knight but the idea was also that if she exchanges knights I'll capture it back with the c pawn and then I will have a great pawn in the center. She spent here a little bit of time thinking and everybody there was so focused like it had been so loud a few seconds ago but now everybody was just playing their games of chess. I'm also realizing from this picture that a lot of people were wearing blue for some reason that day. There's a lot of blue everywhere. I was wearing a blue jacket that I got second hand when I was during that trip. So castles! She finally castled and I realized that I could finally take her bishop and double up her pawns making her get a bad pawn structure. She has double pawns but she also has a d3 pawn which is now not protected anymore which means that I might be able to attack it a little bit later on. I developed my knight now, if she played e5, I could go knight d5, and if she traded my knight, I would be able to take it back with the bishop and keep a good pawn structure. I was finally able to develop, and I was feeling very happy. My plan now was just to simply castle. Rook e1 was played. And... I simply decided to castle. I now felt like everything was safe and I was pretty happy with my position, although I did think that she was playing really well, especially for her age. She was playing much better than I did when I was 11. So she pushed her e-pawn and I realized that it was probably because she wanted to get a knight up to e4 and then to be able to place a knight on d6. So I started considering my options. Should I go knight d5 
and centralize my knight? Or should I go knight e8 and stop her plan of going knight e4 and knight d6? I decided to keep an active knight and so I played knight d5. I was however a little bit worried about her plan of getting a knight up to d6 as that knight would be very annoying. Although I realized that if I ever play f6, her knight on d6 is going to be a little bit misplaced as I'd be able to get rid of the pawn defending it. So I was calculating all of these different things and everything that I wanted was just to make sure that I would have a pretty safe position. I didn't want to enter anything too crazy, but I was feeling pretty good and confident here. I think I was smiling here because I was listening to a pretty funny conversation. <laughs> and when I'm playing chess, sometimes my thoughts drift away into my surroundings. So I think that's why I was smiling there. She played queen d2 to protect her bishop. And now I felt like there might be something. Or at least I felt like I was pretty happy with my position. I decided to capture the knight on c3 because she couldn't take back with the queen as that would lead to her bishop falling. And then I decided to take her knight on f3 because I realized that I would be forcing her to get doubled pawns. Now she cannot take back my bishop here because then I will be able to take her bishop and I will win a piece. So here she has to take my bishop first and do an intermediate move, an intermezzo in chess terms. Bishop takes e7 is the only move that saves a piece here. I was trying to trick her and I was just hoping that she would capture back my bishop on f3 without thinking. She was very close to doing so, but then she regretted her decision and she started thinking and using her time here. And then she saw it. Bishop takes e7, intermediate move. She found the best move, and so we traded bishops, and now I had no extra material, but at least I was playing against her very weak double pawn. So I played f6 to open up the f file for my rook, and now I realized that I would be able to target her f3 pawn very easily. With If pawn takes f6, rook takes f6, rook f8, and now my rooks and my queen are both going to become very strong. She played king h1, and there was a car that started going joink yong joink. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why we both looked. But then, here, I realized that if I take her pawn and she captures back, I'll be able to capture her pawn on f3 and I will be a pawn up. So here, it felt like I was able to get through with all my pieces and I was feeling very happy about that. She realized here too that she was losing a pawn and she was probably not so happy about that. It's funny because in chess you kind of forget who it is that you're playing against. I didn't think that I was playing against this 11 year old girl. No, at that moment me and her were the same age, it was extremely competitive and I was just thinking about the chess game, I wasn't thinking about who I was facing. And that's one of my favorite things about chess. So she captured back the pawn with the rook. And I really wanted to take now the pawn on f3. But I decided to take a moment to just really figure out if that is the best move. After a while, I decided that it was. And after I took that pawn on f3, her king was very weak. But most importantly, I had the idea of going rook f8, targeting the f2 pawn and then just applying even more pressure. So she wanted to counterattack. She went rook g1 to try to target my g7 pawn. I decided to bring the next rook into the equation, rook f8. Now I'm threatening rook takes f2. So she played rook g2 defending. And I had to come up with a way of keeping the attack going. I could go queen f6 or queen h4 to target the f2 pawn again. I just wanted to make sure that she did not in any single possible way have a sacrifice on g7 or have anything that would lead to either a win for her or a perpetual. I spent some time thinking here because I felt like I was already up on time and I was actually really 
just wanting to make the best move. And I felt like I had the time. That's a good thing about Rapid, that you have the time to think. I finally ended up playing Rook F7 to really make sure that she did not have any attack towards my G7 pawn. I was preparing now to go Queen H4 and target the F2 pawn even more. She was thinking here about what to do. How could she continue her attack? I started looking at the game next to me because I thought that the position was very interesting. And then, I don't know what happened, but I think I got something on my hand. <laughs> I don't know if it was some raindrops or what it was, but I got something. She played queen e2, maybe trying to go rook takes g7 at some point, and then maybe if, I, if the rook captures back, my f3 rook is hanging, and also kind of preventing d6, as if d6, there's rook takes e6, my e pawn falls. So here, everything that I wanted was just to keep my ideas going, just to keep the attack going. I went queen d6 to target the d3 pawn. That was my that was the next pawn that I wanted to, to attack. But looking back to this position, I don't really know why I didn't play queen f6 or queen h4. I think it might have been because I, I thought that after king g1, there wasn't really any way of continuing here. And the d3 pawn was much harder to defend as the rook on g2 could not go to the d file. So I thought here the only real way of defending this was going rook e3. But then it felt like both of my rooks on the F file would be very, very, very strong. We have played a long game to this point though, and I was only a pawn up, so this girl was definitely playing really well. And I mean, I, I was very impressed. I was very, very, very impressed. She ended up going rook e3 to defend the pawn. And now I had to make a decision. Should I capture the rook? Or should I just simply move my rook somewhere else, like rook f5 or something like that? So I was thinking about my different options. I also had the option of playing something like queen d5 or queen c6 to defend the rook and keep the tension that I had there. I ended up playing queen d5, defending everything. Now my threat was to go rook takes e3 and then go queen takes b3. And I was really happy with this move. The idea was also that if she played c4, I would be able to go rook takes e3 before. So I didn't really mind her playing c4 and targeting my queen. I now remember that the reason I was smiling at certain parts of this game was because I started hearing Swedish in the background, I think. <laughs> and I was in London, so I was pretty shocked that I was hearing people speaking Swedish there. But I thought that was pretty funny. Then my opponent met people that she knew. And I asked her if that was her dad, but she said no. <laughs> she ended up playing King G1, and now I saw that if I go Rook takes E3, and then queen takes b3, I would just win a pawn. So I was just thinking, should I take the pawn? Yes, I did. Rook takes e3. She went queen takes e3, and then... The pawn on b3 had the potential of being mine. And it was. I took the pawn because not only was I going to be able to take that pawn, I would also be able to take a lot of other pawns. So she went queen, she, she captured the c5 pawn, but the moment she did that, she realized that if she does that move, it's a checkmate. So I told her that she was allowed to make another move because I felt bad, you know, seeing her picking up a piece and then immediately realizing that she's losing if she does that. So I told her that she can play something else if she wants to. Even though in tournaments, typically there is the rule that if you touch a move, you have to play it. Or if you pick up a piece, you have to capture it. 
But I realized that if the winner of this tournament just gets a bottle of wine, we maybe don't need to follow the rules too strictly. <laughs> so I went queen d5, played a few moves, I decided to activate my rook, and now I realized that the d3 pawn was hanging, so I was able to capture it, and not only was I capturing the pawn, I was also threatening the queen, and whenever, whenever the queen went, I would be able to go rook d1 and then checkmate. So her only move here really is to go queen takes rook. But if she goes queen takes rook, I'm going to be so much material up that I'm going to be winning anyways. Here she played out of mistake two moves in one, I think. She went queen c1 and h3. So I told her that the queen was on d1. So she could only, you know, move one of the two. But this was uh, very obviously just a mistake. And now she was thinking about where to go with the queen. She only had nine seconds left on the clock. And after queen e2, I went rook d1, and now it's a checkmate. She has to capture the rook. And after queen takes queen, it is, it is a checkmate. So I did the move, even though her time was gone. And then I won the game, and we shaked hands. We played so well. What's uh, what's your rating? Um, 1,500 online. Yeah. That's yeah. It's good. That's better than what I was when I was 11. <laughs> so I asked her what her rating was online, and she said that she was 1,500. And I thought that she had played better than 1,500 in that game. I thought that she had played very well. So I told her that, and I wished her luck for the rest of the tournament. And I was just very happy that she was so good for her age. And I always just get really happy when I see girls in general playing chess as growing up, I was typically one of the only girls in every tournament that I went to. So I thought it was really fun and uh, I won the first game of the tournament. Now, let me know if you want to see how the other games went as well, because for every opponent, I got a more difficult one. So the games only got harder and harder and harder. And some of these games were extremely exciting. So let me know in the comments if you want to see more rounds of this tournament. Thank you so much for watching this video and I'll see you all in the next one.